Now, in all seriousness, um, one of the things that is really remarkable about the Presidential Precinct and about this Global Leadership Forum is the way that uh, faculty and scholars and practitioners and NGO activists and citizens from around the world are coming together to share their experiences. We do believe at our universities that research and reflection and analysis are part of the solution to these problems. And what we've done is we've asked a wonderful team of faculty at both the University of Virginia and William and Mary to come together and present on four topics that are absolutely central to the global challenges of the 21st century. Those four topics being governance, how to create governance that's stable, liberal, as Professor Zellico said, democratic, open, tolerant, how to create global growth, entrepreneurship in ways which deal with problems of global inequality. That's the second theme. The third theme, which is absolutely vital, how to create environmental sustainability in a planet which is shrinking and facing challenges there as never before. And last but definitely not least, how to create inclusive societies in which women, youth, minority populations, others who are marginalized feel included and respected. I would actually say if those four challenges could be tackled together, we would be a lot better off on the planet in the 21st century. That would really get us a very long way indeed. So we've invited one University of Virginia faculty member and one William and Mary faculty member on each of the themes. Uh, the four that you see here are our plenary speakers, and the other four will join us for the breakout sessions on each of these themes, which you'll have right after lunch. Let me introduce them very briefly. I know time is short. From the University of Virginia, we have Manuel Lerdau right there. We have Denise Walsh. We have uh, joining us later for the breakouts, Ellen Bassett and David Tuve. Are they here? Ellen, David, they may be joining us from classes and such. From William and Mary, we have on the panel Dan Maliniak and Amy Quark. Their bios, of course, are in the program. We also have Rob Rose and Angela Banks. Are they here yet? It's very hard to see up here with the light. There's Angela over there. So hopefully you'll have a chance to meet them as well in the breakout sessions and then after that. We will uh, have each of the speakers speak for seven minutes, so a very brief kind of presentation on these themes and the challenges and how they're tackling them themselves in their work, and then we'll throw it open for Q&A. So without further ado, Dan, if you'd like to start us off. Steve, thanks so much. Uh, and thanks to the Presidential Precinct for having me here today. Uh, if I could describe one lesson that I'm hoping that you can get from this is uh, how we can learn lessons that are systematic and reproducible in the area of governance. I think that, that's sort of the key. So when we're talking about governance, I think it's one of the major challenges uh, facing the world. Uh, when I say looking to, uh, looking to governance, I mean looking to improve the ways by which governments act and provide services to their citizens. And at the heart of it, this is an issue essentially of democracy, right? And the connections between the government and the people. So then it comes to the question of how do we improve this? And I think um, activities like that that we heard uh, Assistant Secretary uh, Ryan talk about, YALI initiatives, Fulbright, et cetera, giving these leadership experiences are incredibly important and helpful. But that's only half the battle. Right? We can't give leadership experiences to everyone. We can't train everyone. Even if we rely on those people who have these experiences to go back home and share their experiences and give experiences to others, we will still not even get half the way there. So I think we have to work towards more systematic solutions. And by that, I would think the answer is good institutions, right? Good institutions, electoral, political systems, norms, more than just those ideas of the ballot box, but increasingly uh, um, law and order. These things will encourage good selection of politicians and leaders. Those leaders may disagree on policies, but at their essence, will have the same goal of serving the people, right? And there's years of research in the areas of political science and many other disciplines that uh, conveniently illustrate the benefits at the international level, the national level, and local level. I think more recently, though, there's been innovations in the methods being used to look at this, right? Coming primarily from the area, I think, of development econ, the idea is that we can experiment with governance. We can think more seriously about systematically evaluating the effects of governance and learning about it. So just as we often refer to the states in the US as the laboratory of the nation, right? Trying some policy in Virginia with the idea of using that as a broader experiment to what we can do in the country, so too can the many countries uh, around the world and villages, et cetera, serve as laboratories for governance. 
And it only happens if we think about these learning objectives as we go out there and try new things. So one of the things we've talked about today to some degree uh, in terms of what is bad governance is cultures of corruption, cronyism, right? these other things that, that decrease the connection between people and their government, and the hopes that potentially technology can help bridge that gap in a variety of ways. So yes, of course, online communication and coordination played an important role in places like Maidan and Tahrir, but I think we would be um, unwise to say that those were clearly the causal elements, right? We've, we, it would be unfair to those many, uh, like Vaclav Havel, um, who have uh, engaged in transformative uh, political processes before. So what I'm suggesting is we think about e-governance as one of the key areas in which we can go fo forward. And when you think about examples of this uh, you know, coming, coming to light as Estonia, a clear leader in this area, uh, able to do lots of things on the internet, voting, filling out forms, doing your taxes, et cetera, from a country that has really only had its independence for some 25 years. So giving some experiences that I've had myself in the, in the Republic of Georgia, um, and how they're trying to implement in, in sort of an experimental method uh, different ideas of e-governance. So the Georgians are very familiar with the idea of drastic changes in governance. Uh, Mikhail Saakashvili, who came to power in the Rose Revolution, in 2005 famously fired the entirety of the tra traffic cops of the country because they were considered incredibly corrupt. Rather than try to change the culture of a corrupt group of police, he just fired them all and hired new people. Right? And if you talk to Georgians, I've heard them say it sort of felt like coming out of a cave. Like it was dark and now it was light. You could walk down the street without the threat of uh, being asked for a bribe or be embarrassed in front of your girlfriend or boyfriend. Right? And this is incredibly important. So I think the internet, though, allows us to not have to rely on firing a huge number of bureaucrats, but potentially taking away certain types of face-to-face -face interactions that are ripe for the potential of corruption. Allowing people to do things online takes away this connection uh, where there's, where there's the, the chance for some uh, exchange of, of services, uh, goods for services. I also think that there's a key link uh, between the people and their government via the internet. So one of the things, the other projects I, I've been helping out with uh, is something called iChange. And this is a product of civil society organizations in Georgia. So it's based around the idea of the website whitehouse.gov. So for those of you who are unaware, this is a petition platform that exists in the US that people can go on and start petitions and share them with their friends to sign. And if enough signatures are received, the White House will answer the petition. And so famous uh, issues that have received enough signatures are things like building a Death Star, a planet-sized space station uh, used to destroy other worlds, and to kick a certain um, young uh, pop star out of the country, Justin Bieber. And so you wonder why civil society organizations in a budding democracy such as Georgia, Georgia are interested in something like that. And I'd suggest that one of the things is that they don't see the joke in that. They see the power of many people getting together and showing their voices all at once. And they have a great deal of trust in their fellow Georgians, and I'd suggest that that trust is not misplaced. Most recently, there's been a scandal in which uh, some videos of certain politicians having extramarital affairs have been released. And rather than responding to these salacious tabloids by attacking the politicians, the Georgians, by and large, have said things like, sex is not a crime, and overwhelmingly said they wouldn't watch the video. They're upset with those who would release these things and go into people's private lives. Right? So I think that their, their trust is well placed in, in the people in this country that they would take something like this seriously. So the... Um, this project is being uh, funded with the help of USAID, USAID uh, with technical assistance from the Estonians and more funding from uh, the EU as well. And one of the things that I've been involved with, with, which I think is particularly helpful, is from the beginning thinking about the measurement. How would we know if this is actually making Georgia a better place in terms of its democratic connection and the governance that's going on there? And this is only possible if you, you start thinking about these lessons from the beginning. So setting up the design and the rollout of this platform in a way that we can take lessons about governance and apply them to other places. So I would say for all of you who are out there and will have opportunities in the future to learn things about governance, to think seriously about how you can take some lessons and share them uh, in other contexts. So thanks so much.
It is a great pleasure to be here today and have the opportunity to address such a distinguished audience. In my brief remarks, I would like to uh, highlight two interlinked challenges that face global leadership today, inequality and legitimacy. Let me first speak about inequality. There have been recent claims that we have seen significant improvements in reducing poverty and global inequality. We have heard that the Millennium Development Goals were largely a success in efforts to reduce poverty. Accompanying these claims um, have been suggestions that inequality between countries, when weighted by each country's population, um, has also declined. Yet I think for many around the world, these celebratory findings seem hollow. And this is for good reason. In reality, careful analysis of these um, statistics have shown that the reduction in poverty and in inequality between countries has been very small and is mainly due to the economic growth of China. China has the largest population in the world and experienced average income growth rates three to four times the world average rate over the past quarter century. And this has successfully pulled millions of Chinese people out of poverty. As China's growth rate slows, however, as appears to be the case, we are likely to see a flattening out of this reduction in poverty and global inequality, or even a reversal of this trend. Of course, if China is eliminated from these calculations, we find that global poverty and between country inequality among remaining nations has not declined in recent decades, but just the opposite. There has been an unmistakably increasing trend. This is compounded by the fact that uh, within country inequality has been increasing in most countries since the 1980s, with China, India, and other nations transitioning from centrally planned to market-based economic systems being the most notable examples. This suggests that we're increasingly seeing a growing transnational elite um, and, a, and a transnational group of people that have been left behind. Now, the persistently high rates of global poverty and inequality, both within and between countries, um, have their roots in patterns of colonial exploitation. Moreover, they demonstrate that the neoliberal economic paradigm um, that pushed an agenda of liberalization and privatization from the 1980s onwards, particularly in the form of structural adjustment programs, has not brought changes to these patterns of poverty and inequality. Countries like China and the East Asian tigers that have pursued greater marketization uh, but avoided the shock-inducing reforms of structural adjustment programs of the IMF and the World Bank have fared better. Nonetheless, it's not clear that China, for example, is a model to follow given um, its own development trajectory that has been uh, accompanied by increasing within country inequality, environmental damage, um, the lack of democratic institutions, and the exclusion of ethnic minorities. From this view, not only do poverty and inequality remain critical issues for global leaders to address, but their persistence has spurred growing challenges to the legitimacy of the global system, the legitimacy of global institutions and national governments alike, uh, and of the global architecture of trade liberalization that has been constructed in recent decades. Examples of this legitimacy crisis are abundant. Um, the failure to complete the Doha round of negotiations at the World Trade Organization. My own research has demonstrated um, the way in which the, um, the inability to achieve the development outcomes of the WTO um, has really rippled into other sectors, into other kinds of rules, and made cooperation difficult. Um, also, the continued calls for a rebalancing of influence at the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund. And finally, a wide range of social movements that are all rooted to some degree in the economic insecurity of growing swaths of the population. The Arab Spring, the labor movement in China, and of course here in the US, Black Lives Matter, Occupy Wall Street, and the political support for both the Trump and Sanders campaigns. Now, I believe we see some hope in the new sustainable development goals that arguably were constructed through a more inclusive process that made room for voices from developing countries. The sustainable development goals recognize to a degree that eliminating poverty will require more than charity. It will require reducing inequality, combating climate change, strengthening labor rights, uh, eliminating Western agricultural subsidies, uh, among other issues. 
Yet this requires that solutions um, to the linked problems of inequality and legitimacy come from broad um, public participation and state action to achieve substantive reforms. Um, this might include global corporate minimum taxes to end um, transfer pricing, to end tax havens, a global minimum wage to put a floor on the race to the bottom for labor. Now, in closing, I want to note that we see many young, energetic, budding entrepreneurs who have a great passion for developing business practices that address social and environmental issues. Um, be it through social entrepreneurship or a triple bottom line that takes account of the social, the environmental, and the economic. Yet these entrepreneurs face challenges in their efforts to maintain their social purpose in a competitive global market. The global leaders of today, um, be they at the global, national, state, or local levels, um, need to respond to these entrepreneurs. Uh, be it by taking a leadership role in setting living wages, like we see in California today, um, or be it by working with local communities in slums to establish safe and dignified access to housing, as we see in South Africa and India. Um, it is these kinds of efforts by global leaders that allow them to take the lead by establishing enforceable institutions that incentivize a race to the top. Thank you. Well, thanks very much for taking a little time away from your lunch to listen for a moment. Um, I'm a little bit of an odd man out here, and I'm very appreciative that to be here because I'm trained as a physical scientist in chemistry and biology, and that sets me apart from at least most of, if not all, of the other people here. And I think it's a good position to come from, though, to talk about climate change as it relates to the goals of the Global Leadership Forum. And it raises the question of why even bring climate change in? This is not, on the surface, a central topic. And I want to first talk a little bit about that and then present to you a strategy for incorporating climate change into local, regional, and national level efforts. So why consider climate change in the context of today's conversation? Um, first of all, this is a problem that is literally affecting every country in the globe. Now, it is primarily caused, driven by, historically and currently, the activities of the industrialized nations. But its impacts are being felt disproportionately in developing nations. And so, developing nations have an, an, an inherent interest in developing and incorporating responses to climate change into their broader development and political growth and strategy. And it's a problem because the causes are truly global. The causes are the summed effects of many countries' activities. But the impacts are truly local, truly regional, or truly national. That is, the effects of climate change that we see today, and we're seeing them throughout the world, are things that are felt by individuals, and they're felt disproportionately by the poorest individuals. And we see these, for example, as decreases in food security in tropical regions, increases in coastal flooding, sea level rise, where a disproportionate number of people live close enough to the ocean that sea level rise over the next 50 years is a problem. And of course, most recently in the news, the spread of novel infectious diseases that are spreading faster than anything we have seen in the historical record. Plague moved very slowly and was present for centuries before it erupted. Zika has appeared on a scale of decades. Now, the second reason that climate change is interesting and a challenge and important is that in contrast to some of the problems we've been talking about today, it is dire but not always urgent. That is, climate change, the impacts of climate change are problems that are occurring not on daily scales, but on decadal and, and centennial scales. And so when we compare climate change to some of the other problems that we face, corruption, lack of education, lack of access to health care, these are immediate short-term effects. And how do we respond to a problem that is as important, but we're really talking about our children, and maybe even more, our grandchildren. Now, 
Before I launch into the solution, I want to focus a little bit on what these responses are, because I think that there's a tendency when discussing climate change, particularly with respect to developing nations and emerging democracies, to be a little bit abstract. But we're talking very specific, measurable impacts, and that allows us to talk about specific, measurable responses. What are these impacts? One, temperature change. We see increases in maximum summer temperature, increases in minimum winter temperatures. These are happening. They've been measured all over the globe. Two, changes in seasonality. That is, rainy seasons and dry seasons are shifting. Winters and summers are shifting. Now, why does this matter so much? This matters particularly in agricultural regions because it can cause a disjunction between the emergence of crops and the emergence of the pests on those crops. And we've seen in some cases the spread of novel pests into systems. We've seen terrible problems in Central America with the spread of novel diseases up in elevation as temperatures warm. This is an enormous problem for developing stable food, food security. Third, rainfall. Rainfall in some areas is increasing and others is decreasing. We now can predict this very well, but this is an enormous problem for the people who have to live with increased rainfall or increased drought. Fourth, storm severity. Storms, big storms are getting bigger. This is a global phenomenon. We know it is happening. We have, it's one of the best documented aspects of climate change. And the effects of these fall disproportionately on the poor. And as I'll argue later, we have responses to this problem that will disproportionately help the poor. Finally, sea level rise. This is, in a sense, the, the, the classic example of climate change. It is moving slowly, inexorably. We know it is occurring. We have to develop a response to it. Interestingly enough, probably the very first organization to consider serious, thoughtful, decadal scale responses to sea level rise was the US Navy. The US Navy, over 30 years ago, began to develop plans for sea level rise for its ports on the coast of Virginia. This is something the US has been taking seriously for a long time, and the rest of the world needs to also. So how do we break down these responses? How do we develop responses to these climate change impacts? First thing we have to do is think about the costs of these specific impacts and think about the benefits of responses. This cost-benefit framework is essential for building sustainable change in the face of climate change. Now, costs are tough to test, to measure with these climate change impacts. They can be diffuse in that it's tough to attribute to a single source. They can be delayed, something that could be happening over very long time scales, and they can be additive, that is interacting with other drivers as well. The benefits of these responses are very interesting. We think about all too often the benefits of pres preserving the environment as something that in some way actually has an economic cost. In this case, I think the opposite is true. Most of the benefits to climate change impacts that we will see are, in fact, things we want to do anyway. And we can use climate change as a wedge to promote some of the changes towards sustainable development that we want. And that brings me to this notion of the strategy for responding to climate change. Um, first of all, all of these responses, be it to a change in temperature, be it to a change in sea level, have to have short-term benefits that outweigh the cost of their implementation. So if we're talking about having to move populations, which is a real possibility with sea level rise, we have to structure these moves in such a way that they're economically viable. They're essential. We have to make them profitable. Um, secondly, these responses have to target visible climate change impacts. It will never work to suggest responses that are so broad and diffuse themselves that they don't they can't be connected to a particular impact. And finally, I want to um, draw your attention to two words that are, that are crucial on this, um, and those are mitigation and adaptation. Now, mitigation in this context means going directly at the drivers and the causes of climate change. And we know what those are. Those are the major greenhouse gases, primarily carbon dioxide, secondarily, or even thirdly, methane and nitrous oxide. But it's really carbon dioxide, and it's really fossil fuel production and consumption that we're talking about here. And to a large extent, 
this is the province of the industrialized world. We're seeing big changes in some countries, and these, these, are, um, these are happening. But adaptation is where our responses need to focus. And we can use some sort of intuitive guidelines here. Coastal areas should be thinking about responses to flooding and sea level. Alpine areas to effects of temperature. And what this focused, locally specific approach to climate change impact allows us to do is it allows us not only to respond in economically sensible ways, it allows us to use the globalized response to climate change that has already been developed. There are funds available for climate change responses from the United Nations, the Global Environment Fund, or RED, that can be used to drive things, changes in society that we would like to see anyway, irrespective of climate change. So in short, I'm actually quite optimistic that we can re respond constructively and positively to climate change because it gives us an opportunity to do what is right and perhaps access other sources of capital and credit in doing so. And I think this is how we're going to address these emerging and growing problems such as food security, such as infectious disease. Thanks. Good afternoon. I have a PowerPoint for you, and uh, I'm hoping it's going to come up. I realized when I got up here that I can't see it. So that's a bit strange. So we'll see how this goes. I'd like to tell you a story today about someone I met in 2001 when I went to South Africa. Her name is Prags Govender. At the time when I met her, she was an African National Congress Member of Parliament. The ANC, of course, is Nelson Mandela's party. Could you flip the slide, please? Great, thank you. So as you probably know, um, apartheid was quite a problem in South Africa. This is when Prague's governor grew up. The separation, of course, of whites and blacks in South Africa. When she was 14, she began protesting against the apartheid regime. Very quickly thereafter, she began to join the trade union movement. Could you switch the slide, please? Great. Uh, the trade union movement uh, began in the 1980s and became quite a powerful movement in South Africa and Govender was part of this movement. Of course, labor unions are absolutely crucial for advancing human rights and democratization around the world. South Africa, no exception in this case. In addition to joining the trade union movement, Govender also joined the ANC's movement. She traveled quite a bit for the movement, including to the Soviet Union, of course, because that country at this time was funding the ANC movement against the United States, which was a staunch supporter, of course, of apartheid. This was during the Cold War. Now, as she was part of both of these movements, uh, she met quite a bit of people, she developed a lot of networks, and she became a very savvy activist. During the 1980s, uh, the trade union movement became increasingly violent as protests took over in South Africa, and the government quickly realized that it would not be able to sustain its control over the population. So in 1990, could you switch the slide, please? Thank you. Uh, they decided to unban the African National Congress movement and its party, and of course, they released Nelson Mandela from prison. This was an incredibly propitious moment in South Africa, and it was one that any activist worth her salt would recognize right, as a moment when they were going to be rewriting the rules of the game. There were going to be negotiations about the democratic transition and the new constitution in the South African country. And Brett Govender wanted to be a part of that process. So could you switch the uh, slide, please? Thank you. The way that she was part of that process is she joined the Women's National Coalition. That coalition was founded by Frené Jinwala, who was a leader in the ANC uh, uh, leadership. And she brought together women from across various races, classes, and parties to argue for women's rights. So this was a remarkable feat in some ways because of course the brothers, uncles, fathers, and sons of these women were all killing one another in the streets. But they came together because they realized that this was a propitious moment and because they realized that if they didn't come together that they would be excluded from the transition process simply because they were women. So they hired Govender to travel all throughout the country during a very violent and dangerous period to interview women's organizations around the country and find out what did women in South Africa want. Govender brought that information back to the Women's National Coalition and they wrote a women's charter. 
and they proposed and presented that charter to Nelson Mandela, next slide please, when he became president in 1994. When he became president, he made Frenet Jinwala Speaker of the National Assembly, and 111 women marched into the halls of power. Next slide, please. Thank you. Governor was among them. She was known as the most, uh, she was certainly the most respected woman in parliament at this time. She advocated for women's rights. She created women's caucuses, women's organizations and institutions within the parliament itself. She advocated for women's rights, including reproductive rights, less sexism in the workplace. She also challenged uh, customary marriage laws that existed in, at this time in South Africa. And she created a women's budget in the state. So then when she, when she and other women were long gone, there would be an institution in the state to advocate for women's rights. This was an incredibly dynamic period in the parliament, 1994 to about 1999. It did not last. Next slide, please. Yep, we're together, that's good. Okay, in, from about, starting in 1998, Nelson Mandela and his successor, Thabo Mbeki, began to centralize power in the executive branch. That meant they regarded parliament really as an institution to rubber stamp their particular proposals. This did not go over well, as you can imagine, with someone like Preg's governor. She got into trouble on two issues. One was HIV AIDS, which of course was decimating the country throughout the 1990s and the other was an arms deal. The government decided it was going to spend quite a bit of money in order to enhance its military capacity. This was absolutely against all the principles of someone like Governor, who is an advocate for the poor. She refused to vote positively for the arms deal. She was the only member of the ANC to do so. As a result, she earned the ire of all of her colleagues. Her committees were underfunded, they weren't called to to quorum at the parliamentary, on the parliamentary table time, as they should have been. She began getting threatening phone calls. Her car was dismantled. Next slide, please. As you can imagine, she decided that perhaps it was time to leave Parliament. She knew that she wasn't going to leave politics, but she was going to leave the formal arena of politics. And she decided that she would continue to speak out to power. Next slide, please. She published a book five years later talking about her experiences as an activist in the ANC as well as a member of the party and in Parliament during the transition to democracy. I'd just like to underscore one word in her title, insubordination. Next slide, please. What does Preg's governor story tell all of us here today? Well, I think it dovetails very closely with the research in politics and gender, which tells us that if you want to advance women's rights, you need first and foremost a feminist movement. Now you can see that skilled leaders are definitely part of this picture, but they're a very small piece of a very complex puzzle, and a skilled leader knows that. A skilled leader knows what the other pieces of that puzzle are. Some of them I've highlighted for you here. I'll just mention a few. For example, networks, you all know that you have to have networks. Of course, this is what Governor did in the trade union movement, as well as, as well as in the African National Congress. But she had to wait for the political opportunity structure to open. That moment, right, when the government began to transition to democracy was key. And that's what created the incentive for women across classes and races to organize and join together. So just to underscore the point and the lesson of Governor's story, skilled leaders are an important part of the story but they're only one piece of the process. Thank you.